Well, if you have your Bible today, and I hope that you do, <clears throat> would you open your Bible with me to Galatians chapter 5? We're going to look at verses 22 through 25 this morning as I share with you about spiritual fruit. And uh, we're continuing to read through the New Testament. I hope that you're doing that. I hope you're reading your one chapter a day, five days a week. And we're just making our way all the way through the New Testament as a church family. We'll have read through the New Testament this year. We'll have preached through the New Testament this year, uh, storying through it. And so today is one of my favorite texts in the Bible about Christian sanctification as we talk about spiritual fruit this morning. What is your favorite fruit? Uh, I would say my favorite fruit is probably ice cold watermelon, especially in the summertime, right? When it's really hot and you get that big old juicy chilled watermelon and it's so refreshing. Uh, it's so delightful. And, and we've all been blessed by the delightful taste of fresh fruit. Uh, fruit is good. It's, it's sweet, it's natural, and, and here's the most important thing. It's healthy, right? I mean, uh, a lot of sweet things we eat are not healthy. But fruit is a God-made food uh, that is healthy f- for the body. Well, likewise, to even a greater degree, we have all been blessed by the spiritual fruit that grows in the life of genuine believers, and as we grow in our faith, as Christ-like, Christ-like love and Christ-like patience and Christ-like gentleness and Christ-like kindness grows in our lives, it, it is something that spills over from our lives uh, and touches the lives of everyone else around us. And I hope that already today, as we walked into this room and you've been around people where the fruit of the Spirit is growing in their lives, I pray that we've already been touched by the, the joy of, of that fruit. When our text this morning, Paul instructed the Galatian believers about the wonderful fruit of the Spirit. And so the main idea that I want you to see with me today as we dive into this text is that when you are rooted in Christ you bear the fruit of the Spirit. It, it happens. It comes supernaturally. It comes naturally. For all of us rooted in Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of, of Christ grows in our lives. And it brings transformation. And it brings change. So would you stand with me this morning to honor the reading of God's Word? And let's read it together and then leave your Bible open. We're going to camp out right here in this text. And uh, let's study this passage about the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, verse, chapter 5, verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep step with the Spirit. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Thank you that the third person of the Trinity, the third person of the Godhead, lives inside of us. What a miracle. And he produces the fruit of Christ, the fruit of Christ's character, in every one of our lives. God, we praise you for this miracle, and we pray that you teach us about it today. Give us ears to hear what your Spirit would say to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. So when you and I are rooted in Christ, we bear the fruit of the Spirit. And so there are three things I want you to notice with me uh, this morning from our text about the fruit of the Spirit. Number one is this, spiritual fruit is the evidence of our salvation. It is the fruit of God's Spirit inside of us that is the evidence that we've genuinely been saved. The evidence of salvation is not that years ago you walked an aisle, you prayed a prayer, and you got wet in the baptistry. I mean, that's not the evidence of your salvation. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing those things. For many of us, we did walk an aisle. For many of us, we prayed and and invited Jesus Christ to be our Savior. And for many of us, we were baptized. But there are a lot of people that go through the motions of that. They just do it because 
Uh, that was something that somebody did and they thought that they should do it and it never resulted in genuine salvation. How do we know if, if our salvation is genuine, if we've truly been saved by grace through faith? Well, the greatest evidence of genuine salvation is the fruit of the Spirit of God that grows in our life. Look at, look at the first verse that we read this morning, chapter, uh, chapter 5 of Galatians, verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit. When you see the word but, that word is a conjunction of contrast. And so what is this uh, contrasted to what? And, and it is our life before Christ. It's contrasting our life before Christ, a life that was in the flesh. Uh, go back up to verse 16 and, and look, look at the context of our, <clears throat> of our text. Paul said, but I say, walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. You see, before we were saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, we were people that were of the flesh. We were born with sinful flesh, sinful nature. And without Christ in our life, that sinful nature is in control. That, that, that sinful nature is, is dominant in our life, and there's really nothing we can do about it. I mean, we can try to live better, do better. We can try to turn over a new leaf. Uh, we can try to straighten ourselves up, but we don't have the power to do that. The flesh is more powerful that, than anything that we could try to do to be better human beings uh, the Bible talks about our total depravity and that we are hopelessly lost without Christ, and we truly are. And, and so when we are without Christ in our life, we are dominated by the flesh, by the sins of the flesh. But when we are saved by grace through faith, that the miracle of salvation also brings the miracle of the indwelling Holy Spirit. It's just mind-blowing, isn't it? It's hard for me to fathom the reality that when we are saved, the third person of the Trinity, the third person of God, takes residence inside of us. We, he lives inside of us. And, and now we are people who are no longer of the flesh, but we are spiritual people. Now, the flesh doesn't totally go away. There's always this constant battle inside of us as long as we live in these fleshly bodies. We have this war that kind of is, is going on inside of us, but, but the Spirit is more powerful than the flesh. And, and, and so he says, if you are led by the Spirit, look, look back there at verse 18, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, what are the works of the flesh? Well, they're evident, he says, and he begins to list them. Sexual immorality, that's sex before marriage, after marriage, that, that's not with your wife or your spouse. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. Now, sorcery is the Greek word pharmakia. It was always associated with drug use. And so drug abuse and sorcery are, are the sins of the flesh, enmity, strife, jealousy, Fits of anger, if you're controlled by anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, all of these are the sins of the flesh. And he said, I warned you as I warned you before. Now, here's a very powerful statement. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the word do is a present tense Greek verb. It means a continual action. So, so what that, the best way to translate that is those who continually practice these things. Not that we make mistakes. We, we do. But those who continually practice these sins of the flesh as a way of life, that is evidence that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that is the consistent teaching of Scripture. Let, let me show you this again uh, in a very similar passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Remember, we read that a few weeks ago, verse 9 through 11. 
Here, here's a very similar passage. Paul said, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He said, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. He said, if this is your habitual way of life, if this is the way that you live, you are giving evidence that you have never been regenerate, you've never been born again. The Spirit of God does not live in you. But I love the next verse. (laughs) Look at verse 11. He said, but such were some of you. Some of you were these things, but you were washed. Washed by what? The blood of Jesus Christ. You were washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You were forgiven. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by whom? By the Spirit of God who lives inside of you. You cannot be a true born-again believer in Christ and not be changed. It's impossible. No more than I could swallow a, a lit stick of dynamite and not be changed, right? If I swallowed a stick of dynamite that was lit today, I would, I would be changed forever. And, and the Holy Spirit is more powerful than dynamite. Are you with me? The Holy Spirit is infinitely more powerful than dynamite. The Holy Spirit is the creating power of God that created all things. If he lives inside of you, you can't have him and not be changed. And the change of of our sanctification, after salvation, we begin the process of sanctification, of growing in the image of Christ, and, and that is the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit that gives evidence of our salvation in, uh, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 and 20, Paul said, Do you not know that your body as believers is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Remember in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, remember this admonition? Paul said, Examine yourselves. To see whether you are in the faith, test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test? So how do you examine yourself? What are you examining? You're you're examining the fruit of the Spirit. Is, Is the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Is that fruit growing in your life? Jesus said this. These are the words of Jesus. Matthew 7, 19 and 20. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. The greatest evidence of our genuine salvation is the spiritual fruit that grows in our life by the presence of God. Now we all make mistakes. Because we have the flesh. That's a war that will always be going on inside of our lives. We still are going to make mistakes and sin against God. But, But we can't live a life of total rebellion against God and and just kind of say well I'm saved so I can live however I want to live that's evidence that you've never truly been saved because you can't have the Holy Spirit living in you and not be changed the second thing I want you to see with me is this that that spiritual fruit is not only the evidence of our salvation but number two spiritual fruit is the character of our Savior When you look at the nine graces of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to read them in a minute, those nine graces are the very character of Jesus. These nine things that are the fruit of the Spirit. It's one fruit. The word fruit is singular. But there are nine manifestations of that fruit that grow in the life of every believer. What, what are they? Let's, let's read those uh, manifestations together. Continue reading verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is, and here they are, nine of them, love, joy, <clears throat> peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, 
gentleness, and self-control. And he got such things, there is no law. So, so who is the perfect example of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Who, who manifested all nine of those qualities in such a perfect way? Our Lord Jesus, right? Never a more perfect example of love or joy or patience. Just think how patient he was with those 12 disciples. Just think of how gentle and kind he was. He loved the least of these people that other people didn't love. Who loved them? Jesus did. And, and what, so what is growing in your life by the Holy Spirit? Christ-likeness. You, you are growing in the image of Jesus Christ. You are becoming an image bearer of the person, Jesus Christ. And those fruits are growing in you naturally. They're, they're, they're growing as a byproduct of your salvation and being rooted in Christ. Notice the very first fruit of the Spirit is love. That word love in the Greek is, is the highest form of love in the, that the Greek language can describe. It's the word agape. Agape love is selfless love. It is a love that is totally selfless, sacrificial. It's the kind of love that Christ had for us when he gave his life for us, even while we were yet sinners. It's, it's the kind of love that loves enemies. When Jesus prayed for those that crucified him and said, for, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. It's, it's a supernatural kind of love. And I would say this, I don't think that we're capable of that kind of love. When we are not born again, when we are in the flesh, I, I don't think we're capable of that. We can't, we don't have the capacity to love with that kind of love. It's only when we are born again by the Spirit of God that that fruit of agape love grows in our life and we become capable of loving to that degree. And then there is joy. You know, we, we don't know joy apart from salvation. <laughs> we might try to find happiness, but there's no joy. There's no real deep abiding joy inside of us that knows God and knows eternal life. And, and that's a fruit of the Spirit. And peace, love, joy, peace. Peace. When you're, un, when you're not saved, when you're an unbeliever, you don't even have peace with God. You're at enmity with God. You're at enmity with your Creator. And if you're at enmity with your Creator, how can you have peace inside? And so there's no peace, no real peace until you're born again and then you have peace with God. And when you have peace with God, you finally find peace in here. And when you find peace in here, you don't have to be angry at everybody all the time, right? Because now you can be at peace with others. That is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And there's patience. Boy, do I ever need that fruit in my life, right? I need more patience and you know, sometimes you may look at me and think, boy, Pastor Bill doesn't have that fruit sometimes. Well, I'm better than I used to be. I can guarantee you that. I have more patience now than I did when I was lost. That's, that's still not saying I've arrived. And we haven't arrived at any of these. These fruits are growing. And then there's kindness. God's people should be kind people. Because that fruit is growing in our life. There's goodness. That means moral excellence. That we understand what morals are. We understand what, what things God says is good. And what things God says is evil. And, and God is producing that goodness through the Holy Spirit. There's faithfulness. That means we're more loyal. We're more trustworthy. That's a fruit of the Spirit. Gentleness means that, that we are no longer uh, a person of anger. But we have a gentle spirit. That means power under control. And then there is self-control, the ability to restrain our passions and our appetites. Before Christ, I was an addict, and I could not control my appetite for alcohol. But it was Christ that set me free from that. And, and the Holy Spirit gave me self-control to not allow that addiction to have power over my life. And, and so the fruits of those, the fruit of Christ is growing. In Galatians 4:19, Paul said, My little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. How is Christ being formed in you? The fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
In Romans 8, 29, Paul said, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Those of us who are born again, God has, God has predestined us to be transformed, conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. It's interesting, in John 8, 12, one of the great I am statements of Jesus is Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He said, I'm the light. And it was his love, joy, peace, patience, all of that, the fruit that, that was a light in a dark world, right? But then you look at Matthew, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus said to believers, you are the light of the world. Now in John 8, he said, I am the light of the world. Now he's saying, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So you're, you and I are the light of the world as we become image bearers of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is the light of the world, it, it, that light now is shining in us. And how is that light shining in us? Because the fruit of the Spirit is growing in our lives. And as we become image bearers of Christ and as love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control grow in our life, we become better people. We become better people to be around. We become better employees. We become better neighbors. We become better husbands, better wives, better dads, better mothers, better grandparents. You see, that fruit spills over. That fruit spills over into every life that's around us. And every life around us is blessed by the fruit of the Spirit that is growing in our life. Without Christ, when we are ruled and dominated by the flesh, then everybody around us reaps the whirlwind of, of the flesh of our life that, that brings pain and heartache to everybody around us. So this is... This is an incredible reality, the, the, the difference that Christ makes. And when Christ makes a difference in you, then that difference affects everybody around you in an awesome way. The third thing I want you to see with me is, is not only is, this, is spiritual fruit the evidence of salvation and the character of our Savior, but third, spiritual fruit is the byproduct of the Spirit. It's the byproduct of the Spirit. In other words, it's not produced by the works of the flesh. In verse 24, if you look at uh, that verse, it says, And those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. The flesh will never produce spiritual fruit. The fruit is not produced by the works of the flesh. You, you don't see an apple tree that's in a garden planted. It, it, you don't see it out there striving and trying to grow fruit, do you? <laughs> it's not out there trying, oh, i got to try really hard to grow this fruit. No, the, it, just ha it just grows. It grows naturally. And, and that's the same with us as believers. You see, it's not produced by the works of the flesh, but it is the product of walking in the Spirit. Look at verse 25. He says, Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. I mean, think about it. The goal of Christian sanctification is not to try harder to be a better person in the flesh, but to root deeper in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the goal of Christian sanctification. It's not trying harder. Oh, I want to try harder to be more loving. I want to try harder to be more patient. I want to try harder to be kinder. No, it's not that. The, the goal of Christian sanctification is to root deeper in Jesus Christ. And the more that we are rooted in him, the more we grow in our relationship with him, the more we fall in love with him, the fruit of the Spirit of Christ will grow so naturally. 
in our lives. In in Psalm 1, my favorite psalm, the first psalm of the Bible, Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. That's what a lot of people are doing today. They're walking in ungodly counsel. They're reading all the ungodly philosophies of our world. They're walking in that. That's what it means to walk in the flesh. They're walking in the counsel of the ungodly. And then they begin to stand in the path of sinners. So when they walk in that counsel, soon they start standing for the same things that the ungodly stand for. They'll argue, they'll argue with you against Scripture. That's, in, that's the flesh. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the godly or stand in the path of sinner, nor seat in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in this book, the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Look, what it, what, look at the promise. He will be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. I want to be like that tree planted in Christ, watering the the fruit of the Spirit by the Word of God. Jesus said in John 15, verse 4 and 5, he said, abide in me. That's an invitation for all of us as believers. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Apart from Christ, we can't bear fruit no matter how hard we try. A branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, which is Jesus Christ. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. And then in verse 8, he said, And by this the Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and then you prove to be my disciples. God is glorified by this fruit of the Spirit. As you and I grow to be more loving and we grow the true joy of Jesus and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness, as that grows in our life, you know what it does? It glorifies God. God is glorified. And and, and he said, by this, my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit. How do we bear much fruit? Jesus said, abide in me. Abide in me. Fall in love with me. Spend time with me. Worship me. And our fruit, the fruit of Christ, will grow in us. Warren Wearsby said, The contrast between works and fruit is important. A machine in a factory works and turns out a product, but it could never manufacture fruit. Fruit must grow out of life. And in the case of a believer, it is the life of the Spirit. When you do works, you think of effort, labor, strain, and toil. But when you think of fruit, you think of beauty, quietness, and the unfolding of life. The the flesh produces dead works, but the Spirit produces living fruit. An old Indian chief was led to Christ And the Indian chief was sharing his testimony. And and, and somebody asked him, well, what's the difference of of you now that you've become a believer? And the old Indian chief said it's like this. He said, well, it's kind of like inside of me now there's there's two dogs inside of me. There's a good dog and a bad dog. And he said, they're always fighting one another. Boy, I can relate to that, can't you? I feel like that sometimes. And somebody asked him. Well, which one of those dogs wins? And he said, the one I feed the most. There's truth to that. You see, when we are feeding the Spirit with the Word of God and worship God and fellowship with believers, we're we're feeding the, 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 the roots, we're watering the roots, our roots are growing deeper in Christ, and the fruit will naturally grow What about you this morning? Are you rooted in Christ? Really? Have you truly been saved? Do you know that you are rooted in Jesus Christ? 
You didn't just walk an aisle one day and pray a prayer and get wet in a baptistry, but you know that you truly repented of your sin. You, you truly abandoned yourself to put all of your faith in Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection for your salvation. Are you saved by grace through faith? Are you rooted in Christ? If you're not, I pray that today would be the day because you'll never be able to be a better person, a better husband, a better man, a better wife until you are rooted in Christ. And my prayer today, if you've never turned to Jesus, you've never put your faith in him, oh, I pray that you would today. If you are rooted in Christ, is your life bearing much fruit? Are you seeing that fruit grow in your life today? If not... Maybe today you need to recommit your heart to to, to rooting in him. Don't walk by the counsel of the ungodly. Don't sit in the seat of the scornful. But, But every day, spend time with God. Would you bow with me as we bow before God this morning? If you, if you, can't, if you say, Pastor, I don't think I'm rooted in Christ. I don't, I don't think I've ever truly been saved, born again. But today, I so want to be. <laughs> today, I long for that. Well, would you pray with me? And again, this prayer is not a magic formula. It's got to be something that you mean with sincerity. But if you mean it with sincerity, would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I need you. I know that I can't ever be a better person without you. I know that my life without you will always be empty and void of peace and no joy. And I know that I will never have that goodness in me without you. That all my righteous things I try to do are like filthy rags in your eyes. And today, Lord, I realize how desperately I need you in my life. This morning, I come to you. I want to abandon all of my false attempts, and I want to put all of my faith in you, your death, your burial, your resurrection for my salvation. I want to trust you. I pray that you would wash away, wash away my sin. Forgive me. Put your spirit in my heart and give me your gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. If you pray that, today is the day of salvation for you. Today is the day that you begin the process of becoming an image bearer of Jesus Christ. And today is a day that everybody around you starts being blessed by the fruit of the Spirit in you instead of being cursed by the flesh. What a great day this is. My prayer, if you, if you meant that, if you prayed that prayer today, I'm going to be right there outside these doors at Meet the Pastor. Would you come see me right now, right after this service? Let me know. Say, hey, today's the day. I made, I made a commitment. I know in my heart to Jesus Christ. Let me encourage you. Let me be the first one to celebrate with you. If you want to come and join our family or you, you're a new person here, I would love to meet you. Come see me at Meet the Pastor.